Good morning. Happy New Year to you. I'm glad to see you this morning. It's a beautiful day outside, isn't it? No, it's not. But you know what? I was thinking earlier on the way here this morning as we went through all of the kind of that atmosphere out there. Isn't it a wonderful thing that the glory of the Lord's Day does not depend on the weather or your condition or my condition? The glory of the Lord's Day has to do with what happened on this day and what we're here and what, what we're really all about. So we're, con- we're really thankful for that and thankful for what we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, as we talk this morning, I want to I wanna focus on some things. Let me, let me start with some bad news. The bad news is that you can look in your Bible and you can sure find out throughout the Old Testament a lot of things that God said, really, you ought to die for if you did. Do you know that? That there are, there's a lot of stuff. Uh, murder, i just run real quick through this. Uh, worshiping an idol or encouraging or urging others to worship idols. Adultery, uh, defiling your virginity. Uh, if you were the daughter of a priest and you went out and practiced prostitution, which had been a terrible thing, but you were worthy of death. If you practiced bestiality, a uh, male lying with a male, sacrificing your child to a false god, blaspheming the Lord, breaking the Sabbath day, practicing sorcery, uh, uh, being a false prophet that led people away from what was right or said something that was false, striking your parents or cursing your parents, uh, being a stubborn, rebellious, drunkard son, kidnapping, selling a man. Uh, if you ignored what a judge told you after he rendered a verdict, he, you, you could be worthy of death. And here's something that you may have never thought about, but being careless. If you had a bull back under the old law, and it was a, a, kind of a dangerous animal, I would figure most bulls are, but it was dangerous and, and uh, had you know caused some trouble before, if you were warned about it, and you failed to pin that bull up, and it got out and killed somebody, they said, you killed the bull, and you killed the man that let him out. You killed the person that was careless with that bull. Pretty stout stuff, if you think about it, when we know that many of these sins are committed in our society today. So here's something to think about in regard to all of that. The question is not really, as I talked to you about this this morning, the question is not, are they worthy of death? Because according to the Apostle Paul, yes, they are. They're worthy of death. He makes a list which many of these things are on in chapter 1 of Romans and other chapters of the Bible. And he says they're, they're worthy of death. But I, I want you to keep in mind he included on that list, if you're greedy, if you're a gossip, if you're a slanderer, arrogant, boastful, untrustworthy, unloving, and unmerciful, you are also worthy of death. You should be executed as far as the law went. The question is not, will those that practice such things miss heaven? Because if you go on in this lifestyle, you will miss heaven in any of these things. It's a fact. Paul said, you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. And his list includes some of those that are right there on that list from the Old Testament. They will not inherit the kingdom of God. The question is not really, can the civil government deal with some of these things like let's say a rapist or a murderer or whatever, can the civil government render justice on people like that? And of of course we understand, according to Paul, they can, and they have the right to, and that they don't bear the sword in vain, they're punishers of those who practice evil things. Unlikely that most of these things would be on the list for civil government, but the point being, civil government can prosecute those who have done things like murder and all the rest. Really, the question I've got this morning is, why don't we just follow that law of Moses? I mean, we kind of have attitudes sometimes that almost lend themselves to this, and that is, you know, well, this is just terrible conduct and it's punishable by death. Why don't we today follow the law of Moses take out everybody on this list, and us as the people of God I'm talking about, why don't we just go out and stone them? Why don't we take them out here in the church parking lot if we're found guilty and stone people for doing that? And the answer to that is that that's not the age we live in. We live today in the age of grace. The age of grace. Titus chapter 2 verse 11 says, The grace of God has appeared. Now, I want you to stop and think about this morning. We live in the age of grace. This is important to understand. The grace of the Lord has appeared. 
That doesn't mean that God had never been gracious before. It does not mean that God had never shown the act of grace until Jesus came. What we're saying is we are in a special time period of grace. It is a special time in human history when God has agreed to spare those who committed sins just like these over here if they will give them up and submit to His Son. God is making the agreement that that is the time period in which we will live. The prophet spoke of this age of grace. Listen to what Peter said, 1 Peter chapter 1 at verse 10. As to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries. They prophesied it, they didn't fully understand it, but they knew that there was going to be an age of grace. I mean, twice in Isaiah, it speaks of a time which would be a favorable time in the sight of God, a time when He would show grace and favor to mankind in a special way, a favorable year of the Lord. In fact, when Jesus began His ministry, He talked about this. In Luke chapter 4, verse 16, Jesus goes to the city of Nazareth where he grew up. He goes into the synagogue. He's invited to speak. He opens up a scroll with the prophet Isaiah reading from him. And in that text it says that he had come to the declare, listen now, the favorable year of the Lord. That's what the prophet said. And then Jesus said, this is fulfilled in your midst today. The favorable day of the Lord is here now, you would understand why Jesus did what he did based on the idea that the favorable year of the Lord had come because we know Jesus would go into a, a group of people and here would be people that were noted by society as sinners. It doesn't always say what their sin was, but they were sinners. They did wrong. They broke the law of God. They did evil. They were sinners. And yet Jesus sat down and ate with them. He didn't call for their execution. He didn't ask for them to take, out, take them out and stone them. He sat down and ate with them because he knew that they needed a physician. Probably no case other than this one in John chapter 8 is so very clear. But here is Jesus. And they bring a woman. Now listen to this. This is not a question about her conduct. It says she was caught in the very act of adultery. In their history, they would have stoned her. She was there to be stoned. They brought her to Jesus and said, what should we do with this woman? They were just trying and testing him. He refused. He did not only say he wasn't going to participate in that, but he says to the woman, neither do I condemn you. But what he did say to the woman is, go your way and sin no more. Now you've got to stop and think. That's kind of a two-edged sword. I'm not going to accuse you. I'm not going to condemn you. I think the point is right now, Yet you've just been caught in adultery. But what I am is going to do is give you an opportunity to repent of your sin. Go your way and sin no more. That's exactly that. And you, again, they were there to stone. Now, Jesus challenged them on this occasion. You remember very well how it went down. He said, if you're without sin, you can cast the first stone. Amen. Now, that underscores something very important about the age of grace. And that is, what it's all come down to is, Every last one of us, you, me, that crowd, everybody but Jesus, really deserves death. We really deserve to be put to death because we've defied God. We've disobeyed God. That's your situation, that's my situation, okay? This is why Jesus could hang on the cross and instead of calling down God's wrath, which they deserved full-fledged all the way, Instead, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Father, forgive them. You're, you're executing the Son of God. How do you forgive people like that? Because it's the age of grace that Jesus is offering. The grace of God, again, chapter 2, verse 11 of Titus, has appeared in an age of grace. God hasn't ordered people to be executed for their sins, but instead He is offering those who committed the same sins that they committed under the Old Testament and died without mercy. 
but he is offering them a chance to submit again to his son because Jesus has become the sacrifice for our sins. This is a new age and it's a new time. It shows this in the opening of John chapter 1, Gospel of John chapter 1 verse 17. The law was given through Moses, but grace and truth have come through Jesus Christ. This is a different age. Christ has inaugurated something new. Grace is the order of things. Truth is the order of things. Paul writes it in Romans 6, 14. For sin will have no dominion over you since you're not under law. Now he's talking about the old covenant law. But you're not under law, but you're under grace. You're under a new system of time. You're under something different. Now, I was refer- referencing this earlier, but in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, Paul is quoting from the book of Isaiah, the favorable year of the Lord again. But he says, he says, what, so it's Paul quoting Isaiah, he says, in a, favorable, in a favorable time I have listened to you, and in a day of salvation I have helped you. Now listen to Paul. He applies this to Christians. Paul says, behold, now is that time. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. This is the day. Now we've got there. Now we're in that age. This is the opportunity. This is the time. This is the age of God's grace. Paul experienced it firsthand. Paul knew about grace as much as anybody, not just because he was an inspired man, but because he experienced it. Listen to him in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13 through 15. I was formerly a blasphemer. What did we read a minute ago? If you blaspheme, put them to death. That's what Paul deserved. That's what he should have had if you're going to operate strictly by the law. But we're in an age of grace, and Paul said, I was a blasphemer, I was a persecutor, I was a violent aggressor, yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. Now listen to him, and the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. It's a trustworthy statement. Now, he's been talking about everybody, but now he brings it home. I'm sorry, he's been talking about himself, but now he brings it home to everybody. It's a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Jesus Christ came into this world to save sinners among whom I am foremost of all. Paul was worthy of death. We all are, but we're... Saved, if we are to be saved, we'll be saved by the abundance of the grace that God gives. We're saved because it is the age of God's grace. Titus chapter 3, verses 3 through 7 paints the picture. We, we were also once foolish ourselves. We were disobedient. We were deceived. We were enslaved in various lusts and pleasures. We spend our life in malice, in envy, hateful, and hating one another. This is our rich history. But when the kindness of God our Savior and His love for mankind appeared, see, there's the idea again. God's kindness has now appeared. He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we've done in righteousness. Here's the grace part now. Not on the basis of deeds done in righteousness, but according to His mercy by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. I believe those are acts that we would think of as water baptism. I believe it connects with that idea. And He is saying He saved us as we obeyed the gospel and came into Him in the waters of baptism, the washing that regenerates, that's just the counterpart to the new birth, born of water in the Spirit. But he saved us by his mercy. And it didn't have anything to do with your righteousness. And when you have faith and repentance and confession and baptism, don't let anybody ever tell you that's your righteousness because it didn't have anything to do with your righteousness. It has to do with your sin. You don't need to be baptized if you don't have any sin. You need to be baptized because you need to wash away your sins. Baptism isn't me coming before God and saying, look what I've done. I've I've got water back there. How great. That doesn't have anything to do with it. It has to do with the fact that in the waters of baptism, God works in me through faith. God accomplishes the cleansing of my sin. It's not my goodness that's doing it. It's God's work. And don't you ever forget it. 
He poured it out richly on us through Jesus Christ our Savior. So that now we are being justified by His grace. And that will help us become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. You have, when you come to Christ in baptism, you have nothing to offer. You have done no work that could merit eternal life. And yet, through the riches of His grace, we can be pardoned and brought into Christ. All of this ought to have a reflection in our life, and, and this is the rest of the sermon if you want to consider it that way. Um, the age of grace ought not to be a time of carelessness and disobedience. A big thing has been done here. A big offer has been made that God would exhibit to you and me grace even though we were worthy of death. This is not a time to be ridiculous or foolish about all of this. This should be not a license to sin, but an, a motivation to do what's right. There was a woman one time that was married to a man. He was really didn't have much love for her, and she didn't have much love for him. But they were married, and no sooner had they gotten married than he presented her with a list of long list of how he wanted his house kept, how he wanted everything done, what kind of meal he wanted cooked. He is a lot dumber fellow than I am, but anyway, he, he just this long, lengthy list, and he stayed on his wife all the time. You didn't do this, you didn't do that, you didn't do this, you didn't do that. And it goes right on and on and on. And they just never did cultivate a love. But she did what she did. I mean, she followed the list meticulously and she got criticized if there was any time she failed it in any way. He died. She married a man that really, really loved her. He offered no list. He just offered his love. And as the years went by, she began to realize she was devoted to him. One day she was going through a drawer and she came across that list. And she shook her head when she thought about it as she married this new man and, and, and had a new husband and, and he treated her so differently. And when she went down her list, she said, you know what? I'm doing every one of these things now for my new husband. But I'm not doing it because I've got a list. I'm doing it because I love him. You know, I, I, it may not be a perfect counterpart, Please don't go away thinking, I don't believe we have rules and regulations to follow, because we do, but can you see the difference between following the law because it's a list of rules and following the truth because we love our Savior and because God has shown us grace and mercy? That's the difference. Romans chapter 6, verse 15 says it. It, it says, what then? Should we go out here and continue in our sins because we're not under the law but under grace? May it never be. Boy, he, he trounces that opinion. He deals with that in the rest of Romans chapter 6 and it's worth reading if you've not read it. Paul himself, he put it this way. He said, you know, here's how I look at me. This is another occasion he's writing in 1 Corinthians 15. He said, I'm not the least of the... I, I'm sorry, I am the least of the apostles. And I am unworthy to even be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Listen to him. But by God's grace, I am what I am. That's a theme for you and that's a theme for me. By God's grace, I am what I am. Thank goodness God has been gracious to me because I wasn't worth anything before. I, by God's grace, I am what I am. And His grace towards me was uh, was uh, in a was not ineffective, excuse me. However, I worked. I worked more than any of them. Yet even then, I couldn't consider it me. I'd consider it God working in me. That's the spirit. That's the age of grace. That's the attitude of grace. He says, when I got saved, I realized I didn't, I'm not worthy of any of this. But if I'm not worthy, I'm going to go to work for my Savior for sure. I'm not going to laze around. I'm not going to act like I can just coast because I'm under grace. Paul said, I worked harder than any of them because 
I had been shown grace. God has been gracious to me, and I, I need to really demonstrate that. And that's it's a point I want you to go away with, because I think we all pretty much understand we're saved by grace on the basis of our faith as we submit to the will of God. But, here's the deal. God's been gracious to me. This thing needs to reflect in my spirit in this life how I approach things. God's grace has taught me a different way to live. God's grace isn't inactive. Look over here in in Titus chapter 2. The grace of God has appeared bringing salvation to all men. Boy, so many people, when they discuss grace, they end the discussion right there. But it says, it has appeared bringing salvation, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires to live sensibly and righteously and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the Lord, uh, our great God and Savior Christ Jesus, who gave Himself to redeem us from every lawless deed, to purify for Himself a people for His own possession, zealous for good deeds. The bottom line is, my gracious response to God's grace is that I'm going to conform my life to the will of God. I'm not going to keep living the same life. I'm going to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. We're in the age of grace. I want to please my Lord. I want to do what He says. And and our job now is to fulfill God's good pleasure. Oddly enough, grace is necessary because we are unworthy, but the simple truth is that Paul writes here in 2 Thessalonians 1, 11, and 12, I want you to be worthy. I want God to count you worthy of the fact He called you. He called you into Him. He wants you to be a part. He's given you this opportunity of grace. I want you to be worthy of that. I want you to fill all the good pleasure of His goodness and the work of faith with power and the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want that glorified and you and Him according according to the grace of our God. If you just kind of start there and then back up at that verse, it makes more sense to me. <clears throat> All of this is according to grace. Then I not sit around the same old person, living the same old way, but I act worthy of my calling. Grace is there to help us repent, to motivate us to repent. Romans 2 verse 4. Do you think lightly of the riches of His kindness and tolerance and patience? You, you don't realize it's the kindness of God that is to lead you to repentance. In other words, God is showing kindness, tolerance, and patience. But we don't need to think of grace lightly. This isn't here. The age of grace hasn't come so we can all be liberated and do our own thing. The grace of God has come so that we will take this very seriously. Matter of fact, he says next, because of your stubbornness, in unrepentant heart, you're storing up wrath for yourselves in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. He's saying, in other words, if I take the age of grace and I am taking it all lightly like it's my time to do what I want to do and act the way I want to act, he said, you're stubborn and you're unrepentant and you're just prolonging the day in which you will receive the wrath of God. So we need to think about that. Why has God shown us grace? God has shown us grace. And because of that, the simple truth is, I need to do a bunch of forgiving. Forgiveness is a key in all of this. Matthew 18, Peter came to Jesus and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Seemed like a good number to me. Jesus said to him, I don't say to you seven times, but 70 times seven. Then Jesus told this parable, which is such a, to me, a wonderful and perfect illustration of grace. Okay, Follow along with me or, or in your Bible, if you will. He said, for this reason, the kingdom of heaven might be compared to a king. He wanted to settle his accounts with his slaves. I'm sorry. When he had begun to settle them, one owed him 10,000 talents, and he was brought to his master. And since he didn't have the means to repay, his Lord commanded him to be sold along with his wife and children and all that he had and repayment be made. Put the man in prison until he can pay me back. That was what he deserved. He ran this bill up when he didn't have any right to and yet now he stands unable to repay. The slave fell to the ground and prostrated himself before him and said, Have patience with me and I will repay you everything. Just 
please give me a little time. I have a wife, I have children, I have responsibilities. If you'll give me time, I'll do my best to repay you everything. But the Lord looked at that slave and he felt a sudden sting of compassion in his heart. He didn't say, I'll give you time. He said, forget the debt. I release you. You don't have to pay it. Great ending, isn't it? Except... That slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. Not quite 10,000, is it? He seized him. He began to choke him and he said, you pay back what you owe. His fellow slave fell to the ground. He began to plead with him. He said, sounds roughly familiar, doesn't it? Have patience with me and I'll repay you. But he was unwilling and he went and threw him in prison until he should pay back all that was owed him. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and they came and they reported to their Lord all that had happened. Then summoning him, his Lord said to him, You wicked slave! Get the impact of that, by the way. Can you imagine in this life if I have not acted upon the Lord's will and been forgiving and gracious in my own ways? Do you envision in the comp? The, the connection with this parable, the Lord grabbing hold of you one day in the judgment day, like grabbing hold of you by the collar and said, you wicked person. I forgave you. I forgave you of your enormous debt. I had mercy on you. Shouldn't that have had mercy? Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? Doesn't that make sense? Now Jesus draws home application and he says he was moved with anger and he handed over him to the tortures until he'd repay everything that was owed him. And then Jesus said, my heavenly father will also do the same to you if each of you doesn't forgive his brother from your heart. Grace given to me means grace given to Jeff or anybody out here. Grace called to come from my heart too. Paul writes in Colossians 3, 12 and 13, he says, So those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience. A wonderful definition of grace. Bear with one another. Forgive each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so should you do also. Listen, you know, you put money in the plate this morning or a check of some kind? Did you do it with grace? We ought to have shown grace in our hearts. I'm ahead of my point, I'm sorry. (laughs) It's what happens when you get 63 and can't really read the screen anymore like you used to. That's why I'm always looking up there. You could say, well, couldn't you possibly go get a pair of glasses? I don't want to look at a preacher with glasses all the time, not after all these years. My word should reflect God's grace twice. Look at it. Don't let any corrupt communication come out of your mouth. Only what's edifying so it will minister grace. Let your speech always be with grace. Seasoned with salt. Grace. Gracious words. Good talking. Administer grace with your talk. We all need to take a hard look. What we've got to say, did it administer grace? Did we act graciously in what we said? Did we tell it with a gracious spirit? Grace should rule in our family life. Now, I don't have a specific scripture about that, but if you think about things like forgiveness and using good words, that ought to permeate the way we act in our family. Grace in marriage needs to remember forgiveness and using gracious words, not being rude and ugly to one another, but being gracious in the way we talk. Grace in child rearing, it doesn't mean we don't discipline. It doesn't even mean we don't physically discipline. It just means that you do it with the right spirit. Matter of fact, we would be violating the law of the Lord if we don't discipline. But you could still have a tender heart. And you could still be thinking of that child's best interest. And you can still sit down with them and hug them and love them and tell them how much you love them even after you've administered discipline because God loves us and He disciplines those whom He loves. You know, grace is shown in how I treat people if they're against me, if they're not favorable towards me. But instead of demanding eye for eye, tooth for tooth, what do we do? We turn the other cheek. 
We go the second mile, Jesus says. We love our enemies. We pray for our enemies. If you've got an enemy, don't seek his destruction. Seek his salvation. Want for them to be saved. Want for them to be pardoned by the Lord. Grace motivates us to do for others, regardless of whether it's going to accomplish anything for us as far as merit goes. I think sometimes in life, I've been guilty of this before too, and that is we sit around trying to decide if somebody deserves grace. Do they deserve our grace, our love, our goodness, our charity, or whatever? You think that's how God dispenses grace? Did you deserve anything? When God pardoned you, you deserved for that? No, you didn't. We don't deserve God's grace. That's what grace is. That's kind of the point here. It's undeserved favor. Love your enemies, Jesus said. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Your reward will be great. You will be children of the Most High because what is God? He's kind. God is kind even to the ungrateful and the wicked. God is kind. There it is. We show God's grace by how we give. Isn't it interesting when we're giving? Well, I guess I've got to give because they'll get on to me if I don't or I'll feel bad if I don't. You can drop that as of today if that's the way you feel about it. Don't give another dime until you can be gracious about it. Because twice Paul referred to the giving he asked people to do as a gracious work. He said it imitated the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. You don't have to be under compulsion about this. We're in the age of grace. God didn't say kind of 10% tax on you. You give willingly and you give cheerfully. There's no specific law about an amount. But there is a law about attitude. Don't act under compulsion because God wants you to be cheerful and liberal and willing in your giving. I'm trying to give you out a few implications of this grace. Look, <clears throat> you know, grace isn't just about you. It's about all of us. It's about stopping and thinking for a moment. If, if grace is so important to me, how about the person sitting next to me? It's interesting that the Hebrew writer said, you see to it that nobody misses out on the grace of God. Comes short, some versions say. See to it that nobody misses out on the grace of God. Don't let anybody, because they got a little bitter or whatever, grow up and have a thing that might defile them. Help them over that. Try to keep it. Don't let you, don't let anybody miss the grace of God. It is so dangerous to ignore the age of grace. Tell you what, you know, in our text we've been talking about this morning, I skipped the first line. Like Paul talks about the, you know, the favorable time and today is the day and, and all of that. <clears throat> he started that by saying, don't you receive this grace in vain. Don't you miss out on it. Don't, don't, don't let the grace of God have come. You know, number one, there's a lot of people who just haven't even heard about it. But if you're here this morning, you've heard about it. So don't let it come and accomplish nothing. The grace of God has appeared. Because here's the fact. According to God's word, the age of grace is an age. It's, it's a, you, you know how sometimes they talk on a bill you pay and it says, now there's a little grace period in here. Because it may say, well, it's due on this date, but we'll give you to this date to get it done. It always confuses me a little bit because I figure it means the last date. But the point is, there is a time. This is an age it will run out. It will come to an end. It will be followed by the day of judgment. We don't talk about tomorrows. We talk about now, according to Paul. Now is the day. We don't know what will come. Don't receive it in vain by not obeying the gospel. Don't receive it in vain by not repenting what you could have had, what you, by not repenting when you could have, is what I'm trying to say. There is a Y'all all probably have heard of a LaGuardia airport. <clears throat> but that, you know, that's named for somebody. And, and it was named for a, a mayor of New York City. And his name was LaGuardia, last name. And La, mayor LaGuardia was an interesting character. 
It was a long time ago before any of us were ever around, most likely. But he, he got real involved in his mayoral role, I mean, in a personal way. He would, uh, he would sometimes get on the news and read the Sunday funnies to kids. He, uh, he, he took a whole orphanage one time out to, ball, to a ball game. He, he got involved. And one night, he was going around looking into things. He, he went to fires when the fire, not everyone, but you know, he, he might ride on a fire truck one time. He might, another time, he would uh, go out with the police when they'd make a bust on a speakeasy or something like that. So, you know, that's the kind of guy he was. And he, he went to a court one night looking in on it, and the guy really needed to go home, the judge, but it was night court, and, and he told him, go home. I'll cover this tonight. So he sat there, and one of the cases that came in that night was a, uh, was a woman that had stolen bread. And uh, he kind of leaned over to the, seeing her situation, kind of leaned over to the shop owner and said, can't we just kind of let this go? And the guy said, no, I'm not, I'm not refusing to press charges. I, I'm going to do it. It's a bad neighborhood, and people do this to me. So he pushed for the charges. So he turned around and, you know, checked the witnesses and all of that. Well, finally the lady acknowledged she had stolen the bread. And he said, well, I'm going to have to fine you for it. The fine back then was only $10. He said, I'm going to have to fine you for it because you're guilty. But even as he was saying that, he was reaching in his wallet to get out $10. He said, but I'm going to pay your fine. And he said, furthermore, I'm going to fine everybody in the room 50 cents. And they took the 50 cents from everybody in the room and then they handed it to the woman at the inn and said, go take care of yourself. Turned out she was a grandmother with a daughter at home that was very sick and she was struggling to try to take care of the two grandchildren at home. And all of a sudden, everybody in the courtroom understood. I mean, I'm not saying it's right for her to have stolen the bread. Don't get me wrong. I'm saying everybody sort of administered grace, didn't they? And that night they gave her $47, which probably was quite a bit back in that day and time, to help with bills and food and all the rest. Said the whole courtroom cheered when it happened. Said even the grocer forked over the 50 cents, probably more than the bread cost to begin with. The point being, you know, when we look at our lives, we can appreciate grace, can't we? And not only should we ever be thankful for God's grace, but we should ever be reflective of it in the way we conduct ourselves. Make up your mind. This affected me, by the way, to, to gather this material and preach this lesson. I want to be a gracious person. I, I want to be a person that reflects God's grace. And I don't want to take it for granted. It, it's, it's going to run out one of these days. And when that day comes, we want to have lived with service to Christ. You don't want this day to run out and you've taken the gospel in vain or his grace in vain. Make use of it while you can. Be the person you need to be. Become obedient to Christ if you've not yet done it. And I would welcome you this morning to step forward down the aisle and come profess your faith in the Son of God. Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins or that would be a correct response to God's grace. And if you have not exhibited it, lived wrong, Come back, let's pray. God will still forgive you of your sins and you can be finding His grace once again. While we stand and sing, I invite you to come. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed?